Knock Off Nation, episode 31, back on deck. Uh, Favourite time of the week. Thank God the working week's over. We can finally get back to doing what we love. Uh, riding that uh, wave of momentum from uh, ep- episode 30, Josie James, uh, the outlaw. The hangover. Fucking, yeah, <laughs> straight, straight up. <laughs> we went deep on that motherfucker. Th- three hours. Three hours. Yeah. Who knows how long this one's going to go, but uh, knockoff regulars, Danny, uh, Kyle Stevens sitting in tonight for hey. uh, Chris's Chris. absence. Chris has been away all week, so he might have gone for a little uh, empty out. <laughs> <laughs> for, for his Friday night But uh, joined tonight by uh, as Just confirmed uh, Retired professional rugby player Dallin Murphy Welcome mate Thanks boys Good to be here Yeah thanks very much for coming man We've got um, Got Dallin on Same sort of thing as Josie Just networking through social media as well So we've got Have a few mutual friends through Dallin And have actually watched him play Play plenty of footy professionally At this point now mm-hmm. But uh, it all started for you At, uh, at Nudgy College yeah, mate, went there from, uh, from grade eight and, and progressed through and was mainly a cricketer when I first started out. True. Mm. And then uh, also a swimmer. And then as I kind of got older, I preferred the rugby union and played in the seconds at Nudgee, um, but then kind of progressed from there. It is a, a, for Nudgee College, for all the, uh, the non, non-Queenslanders out there, it's an absolute rugby union factory for, in terms of development, developing mm. talent. There's a list of uh, wallabies as long as your arm from... Rocky Elsom, Elton Flatley back in the day to mm. more flash forward to James O'Connor. Mm. Blair Connor from your grade at school. He's playing yep. professionally overseas now well and has made a go of it. Yep. Uh, Namani Nadolo in your grade as well? Yeah. yeah, well, just out of our grade, we had Namani, Willie Chambers, um, Blair Connor, obviously, and then there's a host of other boys that have gone mm-hmm. on the as well. Ridiculous. Yeah, Willie Chambers, he's one I forgot about too. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's, yeah. he's fucking made it. Like, he's <laughs> made yeah. it. He's, Big he's, time, mate. Uh, Lee, League, obviously, his preferred platform, but he had a, he dabbled in the Reds as well. He did, yeah. Two years of the Reds. First, he was pretty fruitful, but after that, he kind of struggled. But yep. back, back on deck in in state of origin and shit now. But mm. you say before where you've uh, you played second fifteen at Nudgee, so you've gone on to to play at a professional level now to playing for the Queensland Reds. It was always had an interest in rugby, but your skill set developed further in time. I think it was more my size. So I True. finished high school and I was, I was sixty kilos. And oh, wow. I wasn't wow. allowed to play anywhere else but halfback And I hated halfback All you do is pass the ball yeah. <laughs> So I more preferred fly half And then I kind of I guess I hit puberty at 18 And you know Got up to 80, 82 kilos Late Oh right. wow Late <laughs> 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 It all kind of happened Yeah so. nice Nice Yeah it's good Straight to Generally a lot of people that do Attend Nudgy College The natural club affiliate Is his brother's rugby club in Brisbane So straight straight down there Did you play Colts football? Yeah, played two years of Colts But I was there since I was seven So me and my two brothers Damon and Kieran obviously Played down there since we were little And our dad coached us all the way through as well So Interesting Yeah, Mm. so Shit, there's a good chance I might have I might have played you back in the day for Pine Rivers Puma. Yeah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Puma's, Puma's days for us. Dan, Danny and I we played down there from six to sixteen, basically well, too. But come across each other. We had um, yeah, I'd say so. Danny and I. Were, there was enough kids at that point in time where, in junior levels, there was Puma's blue and Puma's white. But Danny was in the white, so I was in the blues. But. <laughs> The blues were basically the A's and like. That. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? Is that correct? Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the B's just had one absolute freak star player. <laughs> <laughs> Clement, yeah. <laughs> Shout out Clement, no. Oh, yeah, dead, dead sick. This, this Polynesian kid Clement, who went to Brisbane State High in our grade, yeah. uh, it was an absolute freak talent. But we ended up merging in teams, so. I dare say we've probably played against yeah, each other in the definitely. past, but I'm um, surprised you don't remember me, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. like I was, uh, Had that John Hill's yeah, yeah. head tape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, your yeah. career's taking off yeah. at 18 and I'm fucking retiring yeah. at 18. Yeah. I'm, like, yeah. I'm injured as yeah. shit, so... Yeah, you used to call me the hitman. <laughs> Footy was hard back then, bro. Nah, I was like you, man. I was a cricketer, mate. Like, yeah. I, I played rugby and, and really, really enjoyed it, but, you know, w- with age and maturity and hindsight, uh, I was... Fucking pretty ordinary, mate. Like, but <laughs> every football team I was in, I goal kicked for. So that that was that was the one thing that got me by. Where I'd played from every position. From I started at fly half, and my dad was the manager of this Pumas Juniors team as we we're underage. So pretty sure there was some favouritism. Like, <laughs> right, what do you want to play, man? <laughs> played everywhere from prop. Ended up at prop. So yeah, yeah not, not not ideal, but versatile, uh, mate. Most definitely <laughs> had, had a skill set, but from from Colts footy. At what point did you realise, hang on, I, I could make a go of this? When did you shift to, to fly half? Well, straight away, my, you know, my the opportunity for me was to play fly half. It's what I wanted to do all along. And then I started off in Colts 3 and kind of made my way up. But it kind of wasn't until probably my second year that I started to hit my straps. 
played Queensland Nineteens that year, and then you know thought that I could actually make a fist of it. So mm. I was at uni at the time, and you know just studying away, and then just kind of progress from there. Who else was in that Queensland Nineteens team? Anyone of Notable name at this point. Um, I know it's a decade ago, so I've probably fucking put you right. <laughs> <on the spot. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, who's the prop in your under sevens <laughs> team there, at brothers? Man, I think under I'm, the oh, bus. Yeah. I think I'm, I hold, still hold a grudge against the motherfucker. Like. I think I think probably Richard King was was the one out of there. Right, like that was um, he. Kind of went from there and, and progressed pretty quickly. Like he had a really good under nineteens, and then went from there. Like he, he ended up playing Stade Francais, like yeah. the Melbourne Rebels and the Reds. No, nice. I think he might get a Wallaby cap at one stage, but well, like, I think he may have two at yeah. one yeah. point. Yeah, but uh, even if you get one, you still got one. Oh, absolutely, not. definitely. Mm. You uh, progressed through to premier grade status from there. Mm-hmm. Um, won a premiership at, at Brothers as well. Yeah, we yep. went to a few yeah. grand finals, yeah. but only won one. Sure. We were there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we felt yeah. it. Yeah, we <laughs> witnessed that hurt a couple of times. Actually, it's like, nah, this this their year. Seriously, <laughs> yeah. seriously, boys, like boys. This like, is uh, it. It's gonna happen. Oh fuck, God. But, <laughs> The one that you got, though, that was uh, Brendan McKibben was there in your year then? He was, So yeah. he, he went on and applied his craft professionally after that as well. So yeah. that 9-10 combination basically just steered everyone to that premiership as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like, Definitely. Kibbo's one of probably the best halfbacks I've played with. And De- you can see now he's playing his stride overseas for, for London Irish and he's still kicking along. So. Nice. That's true. Yeah. Making a go of it. That's yeah, good. Definitely. good. Because he went from, from playing brothers straight to the Waratahs. Like, had, had, had a lot yeah. of success. Got really good... Really won, a comp, won a comp with the Waratahs, yeah. Oh, wow. No, yeah, half, yeah. No, there you go. Unbelievable. At what point... So you progressed into Premier grade. When was there an expression of interest from the Reds? Like, did you... Do you, do you have a manager at that point? Or? Nah. So there was never really an expression uh, from really anybody at that stage. I was playing Premier grade. I think it was my second year. And then Japan came and played a game. And they were playing against Queensland Reds. And I got called up really late. And then from there, I played really well, scored a try. And even after that, like... No one really offered anything. And it wasn't until kind of you and Mackenzie came along and they offered me an academy deal and then he liked what I was doing and then he progressed me from there. So not until probably 2011, I think. So so how late. do you hear, like, you're sort of playing club rugby down at Brothers and then, I guess, different different folks in the know are just seeing you play in that in that game and you were just approached by you and McGregor. Uh, by, um, you and McGregor. And McGregor. <laughs> <laughs> Come you in and here, yeah. Alan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so it was... Um, just like a scouting type situation? I think it must have been, yeah. yeah. Like, Paul Carrozza, I think, he was the one initially and we did the academy, but then it kind of progressed from there. Ewan came in 2010 and coached right. and then... 2011. So, and what was that like getting the getting the call up for the first time? Had it been something that you'd sort of like you know through through those early years playing down at Brothers and stuff like that that you'd always had that vision? Were you one of, one of those boys, or you sort of just loved the game and and just got good at playing it once you once you got big enough type of thing? Yeah, I think that was it. I, I obviously grew in confidence, and I was playing mm. some good footy playing Premier Grade, and it was initially it was, it was actually a, a kind of sit down with one of my best mates, Pete Petnari. You guys might know. We kind of sat down over beers one night and he said, like, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, I want to play professional footy. He said, well, you know, let's do it. And so we sat down and I was at uni at the time and kind of didn't drop out but changed unis, went to a business degree and then just kind of focused on my footy flat out. Mm-hmm. And then from there, it just kind of progressed. I got better at premier grade and, you know, the door kind of opened up with that Japanese and then it kind of slowly progressed from there and then into the academy and then onto the Reds t- t- uh, or the top squad. And then... Um, I debuted in 2010, I think, just with off the bench against the Chiefs, and then in 2011 when the boys won it, and then again in 2012. So, did it feel like a big sort of noticeable step up in in competition? Like once you first ran out against the Chiefs, was it? Yeah, yeah. The Chiefs not so much, like because I was only on there for five minutes. All I did was tackle. Yeah. Yeah. So that was okay, but I went on to start a few games and mate, like absolutely. Yeah, Reds. the intensity. Stupid. <laughs> yeah. you tra- training with uh, Red's top squad. So are you employed full time at that point? To yeah, absolutely. So you go to, go to training every day and stuff. That yeah. must be a great atmosphere with professional athletes and, and the boys. Like most definitely dr- dream job sort of stuff. What is yeah. what is like a like if you if you're playing for the Reds in the run on run on team? What's a sort of standard work day look like for you? You're down at Ballymore first thing in the morning or. Yeah, so there's a top... Now we go for coffees. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cruise down for coffees. <laughs> Tenerife. Like, yeah, straight hey, mate, to New well, I'm actually yeah. just fucking getting over my hangover at about 11. <laughs> 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 yeah, so sorry. That, yeah, they have the top 30 and then uh, the top 30 players, plus you have, uh, you know, an extra five or six. And then um, 
you're kind of there every day except for Wednesdays. And you're there from like 9 o'clock in the morning till about 11 and you have lunch and then you're back in the afternoon from 2 till 5. On the field, training, yep, like gym, skills gym. or in the gym. Mm-hmm. Yep, so your mornings yep. usually consist of gym, speed and skills. Yeah. And then the afternoon is usually a field session. Yep. Do they feed you as well? No, nah, nope. they don't. Not here. They don't often do that in Australia, but I yep. guess it happens a lot most yep. definitely. I yeah, thought that'd right. be something that would keep oh. keep monitor of, that, like yeah, nutrition. You know, a cu- couple of the big props just cruise down to Hungry Jacks and more <laughs> there for, for the yeah. lunch. But I suppose yeah. if you're training your ass off in the afternoon, you're going to be fucked after yeah. Yeah. eating something like that, right? right? But you have a dietitian there who's full time, basically. Right, comes in, okay. Monitors skin folds and gives you diet plans. And things oh, you shouldn't, right. shouldn't be eating, but like it's you know it comes down to actually what you want to do. Mm. And what's yep. the sort of like. Uh, you know, MO for, for the dietitian, are they like bulking at all costs? We actually had um, Drew Mitchell on here for one of our earlier episodes and he was saying when he first started, the, the basic like diet recommendation that they got was that they have to eat something the size of their fist every two hours. <laughs> yeah, sort well, of a similar type. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> it's a little yeah. bit more he science. Ca- he, came, yeah. he came through in 02. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Science has increased. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that was all But that's the thing wrong. with rugby, eh? Like, the build is, like, big. Mm, and and yeah. I found exactly the same. I, like, fucking terrible football player, played a bit in, in high school as an open side flanker. And, you know, like you're saying, as, as you start to sort of transition from basically a boy into a man, you find out who's big enough to be, like, effective at this game and who's yeah. not sort of thing. It's a really big factor. So We've all seen that man-child. If you've played any oh, form yeah. of sport Absolutely. at a junior age, you've seen someone who excels at 14 to 16 years old mm. Mm. Or even earlier than that, in fact, mm. too. From age of nine or ten, where some, some dudes like start to really hit adolescence at that age, and then by sixteen, everyone else is already caught up. And it's definitely. like, oh well, that's that's over for that guy. So it, mm. so the, you play the hand you get dealt, but. You know, ninety eight percent of people don't get to a professional athlete status. So. so, are they giving you like a, a calories per day that you're supposed to hit and that sort of stuff, or how does it work? Yeah, it's essentially like uh, you have six meals per day. The basically they work it, and it's very similar, but it's like 150 grams of protein, right? A certain amount of green, a certain amount of this protein shake after every exercise. You have the meal supplements, your right. creatine. You're doing all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But was I was never really a big believer in any of it. You true. Know what I mean? Yeah. Like the three square meals kind of did me. Yeah. I had the protein because you kind of had to take it, but like the creatine and that, like it mm. just didn't see the benefit. Mm. No. Mm. You're and not going to be uh, stepping on a stage and working those muscles or anything. It's not for show. Yeah. Yeah. And then on top of the body waxing and the tan. <laughs> 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 It's just too much work, you know. Yeah, yeah, leave the creatine just, out. Yeah, dare, dare say some of those boys would be looking after themselves like that. Yeah, absolutely. The Reds, uh, the preseason that you did as a professional, was the most difficult that you've done. Like no. The, 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 no, 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 right. not at yeah. the Reds. No, Japan's absolutely horrible. Really? Yeah, like they just run and run and True. run. True. You're there for six months. So oh. basically, the way it works in Japan is you're there from April. You don't play till September, and you have like two or three weeks off in between and you're just running and like that's oh, it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> running. Oh, <laughs> so much running. How do you keep the weight on at that point? Like well, you, you really don't. Yeah, I mean, no. a lot of the boys over there apart from the big guys uh, that we don't like, you know, Michael Bond was over there when I was over there and he went from like 98 kilos to 92 kilos. He's true. He's wow. someone that I wanted to touch on with you as well where we had a couple, same sort of situation where we've seen you play plenty of footy without knowing you. Michael Bond was the same for me where I'd watched him play Redcliffe Dolphins Rugby League from yeah. from a young age progressed through that might be one of the most naturally talented footballers t- to ever lace up a boot uh, Michael Bond he at junior level was everybody was, knows was, the name Michael Bond was, growing up for, in Brisbane yeah, so yeah. Sure. Yeah. oh Bondi yeah. he was uh, <laughs> oh Bondi yeah, yeah, yeah Bondi yeah. oh uh, everyone knows Bondi seriously <laughs> he, he, had a, he went to primary school with a mate of ours Brad who's been on the podcast before and yeah. he, he was our link to watching him but he was one of, an absolute natural and ended up playing a bunch of primary grade down at North but um yeah, and brothers. And, and brothers, yeah, right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, he did so have he a kind of, um He came from league uh, at the Bronx, the Roosters and the Storm and then he came to North oh. to play some footy and then was playing for Grade, then got a gig in Bria Ritz and then came back from that <laughs> and then was going back to North. So I gave him a call and said, you know, come down to brothers, you'll actually yeah. win a few games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you hate winning, <laughs> mate? Why are you going to North? <laughs> like, nah, we got our, we're firmly entrenched <laughs> brethren here, mate. Like. <laughs> and then... Um, but yeah, he came across and played some, and now he's obviously stuck over, not stuck over in Japan, but killing it over in Japan. He's probably the best back over there at the moment. And you touched on it, like naturally gifted, mate. He's 
probably the best outside back I probably would have played with. Like yeah, genuinely, right. like That's for natural talent and, mm. and that mm. kind of stuff. Like he just does freakish things and still today at, at 30 years of age, he's doing freaky things. He That's did. Like, there was things like that, the <coughs> the uncoachables where people have footballing instincts mm. like that. Where yeah, absolutely. He, he, to me, and it was, there's a, a huge comparison, but hearing someone who's been at the professional level, he always reminded me of Brad Fittler, Michael Bond, where he had, he could kick, kick pass, run, step, just was the the total package basically and it's good to hear like obviously no exposure to japanese rugby out here in yeah. terms of live streaming and stuff but it's no surprise to hear that that guy's still killing it over there Absolutely. and so how does this the whole japan thing work like there doesn't need to be a line of um actual heritage that you that you sort of qualified to play or is that, there anything like that like it's, it's an interesting question so it works over there you, you get six foreigners that you can sign and register right and those guys can play when I was over there, you could only have two guys on the field at once. But oh, now yeah. they've opened it up to Two three. foreigners on the field. Two foreigners, really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So now they've opened it up to three, uh, two guys and then an extra guy. So the two guys, originally they can be internationals, but the third guy kind of played international footy. So trying to qualify a lot of guys for the next World Cup. And that's right. why there's a okay. lot of foreigners now in the okay. Sun Bulls. They're using that as a program to kind oh, of progress yeah. yep. the national side and get as many guys in mm. involved as possible. But besides that, there's also Asian passport holders. So any guy who has a passport within the Asia region yeah. can come across there and play, and you're allowed two of those guys as well. Okay. And they're allowed one on the field at once. Right, okay. Mm. Okay, yeah, it's interesting, eh? Did you have a, a manager that scouted jobs for you over there? Is it like, oh, well, you know, I could, I could explore going overseas? And I, I, people, originally when, like, uh, Matt Guido drew f- first sort of, like, when overseas, people are like, oh, they're going for the money and things mm. like that. I would never begrudge for someone to go get that life experience like that too where a lot of people are like, oh, he's taking the cash, he's turning his back on the brum, but he's like, what's he doing? But <laughs> when can you go and live over there? You've got 100%. professional sporting career. You've, it's a very finite experience where if you can play till you're 35, you are very, very fortunate. So Most definitely. So Everybody you, was saying you, that about Jared Hayne, man. I was like, fucking go yeah, for it, yeah, bro. Yeah, like yeah, if you it, can have like a life experience that you fucking run on for the for the, San Fran, like come on, son. Yeah, like Exactly. So you, shit. You had a ma- did you have a manager that sort of... Yeah, I did. So my first contract, I didn't have it for the ones at Reds. And then uh, I had one when I went to the UK. He got me that deal. But the way my kind of Japan one worked was Zane Hilton was coaching there at the time with Andy Friend and I knew Zane from Back at Brothers. He just kind of approached me uh, via Facebook and then just kind of progressed from there and then my manager uh, took care of everything else. But that's the, that's the role of the manager to, to pick up things overseas for the boys and explore all options. Because mm. obviously here now, and especially with the situation we're going through at the moment where we're losing a super rugby side, mm. there's going to be, you know, 10 to 15 guys out of jobs. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so you've got to explore all your Plus options. You staff as well exactly too. It's, right. it's, it's huge for that. But that was you, you touch on that too. I definitely wanted to get to that at some point as well with the state of super rugby in Australia now is is, is it quite dire straits? I mean, if there's talk of someone folding, is it confirmed that someone is going to go under by, by year's end? Uh, from all reports, yeah. Like I was at a conference uh, on Wednesday down in Sydney and, and Bill Pulver was talking there and he was basically saying that someone will go and this is the way they feel it's the best way for Australian rugby to progress. They don't feel like they can afford one and they don't feel like we have the talent pool to to keep five yep. teams. And with that talent pool, they've got... Uh, so all the... We've just watched um, a bit of schoolboy rugby lately um, uh, and the quality there is just really increased in the last 15 years since we've been there. And where are these good players going? If they... You know, what are they... What's If, Australia, if that's progression... Um, to because we all all knew it was school Colts, you know Prams, you know that's the progression, and then you play for like an Australian team. But where's where's that happening? Is there a disconnect somewhere? It's not so much a disconnect. It's you know we're competing against AFL, we're competing against True. soccer to a certain degree, and we're competing against rugby league. And so rugby league yeah. and AFL are basically poaching every every every. Oh player. right. So any guy who's over two foot two two meters tall is going to AFL. He's picking up a 50 to 100 grand a year contract. Mm, wow. And he's developing his body, even if he goes there for two years and, and comes back, like, you know, mm. why wouldn't you take that? Yep. And then any good, you know, ball player or, or, or playmaker, you know, he's getting offered the same thing to go to rugby league for a couple of years. Like Caelan Ponga, you know what I mean? That oh, yeah. Is, like, it's... His highlight reel was insane. <laughs> <too. Yeah. laughs> That's the thing. He, like, Caelan Ponga from the Cowboys, he goes to... He went to uh, Anglican Church Grammar School in, in Brisbane and was a fullback through there. So he played rugby, rugby all through high school, was... 
on another level to every other kid running Absolutely. around out there. Carmichael, huh? And bang, yeah, yeah. Like, Carmichael, same thing. Bang, goes straight through, rugby league contract. And Caelan Pong has played only a handful of NRL games at this point and signed for 800000 a year at Newcastle next year on, on potential. Like, that, is, that is stupid yeah. cash for, for someone in that position. But you can't begrudge anyone for taking it. Like mm. I've, A couple of like the Cowboys fans like, oh, we, we gave him his in, you know, we developed him along. Like, you can't offer this kid 800, so he's going to take it. Like, you just, you absolutely have See, to. See, I always thought the league was the one that had the salary cap and the money was in union mm. because wasn't that the original sort of poaching was as people going to union for, for more money to get away from the salary cap? Is it just that the, the clubs aren't generating enough enough revenue or what's the, the sort of... The, the, play, the player salaries would be... Would be decent to, to this point. Would it be comparable to a an a, like a Super Rugby club in Australia? Is their pay structure similar to what the Melbourne Storm would be? Like, do they do they have a, do they have a cap? Yeah, they do. So they've got a cap of around five. Right. But rugby league is you know it's I think it's edging up to close to ten now. Mm-hmm. Right? It is, yeah. Which is nearly double, and you've got basically two tiers of contracting now in rugby league. You know, you've got the, the top twenty five, and then you've got this additional twenty five. Right. Still earning decent money, you know what I mean? But obviously, there's guys of you know Jared Hayne, they're getting one point two million dollars a yeah. season. Mm. That's unheard of in rugby, mm. unless you're going to you know the likes of Toulon, yeah, or yeah. yeah, overseas right. or Japan or those kinds of things. Like it's just the current state of rugby in Australia, and yep. it's as sad as it is. That's that's where we're at. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. For me, it's like <coughs> it, it's almost like a logistics thing. It's like if you don't have Foxtel, you can't see the games. Yeah, so exactly. it's like you know the the average sort of punter that's tuning into Friday night footy, you, you end up getting into the league because it, there's just not as much access to it. And I don't if know. You, go, if you, you know, go, you're dead right, Dan. You can turn on you can turn Channel Nine on the most conventional Friday nights. You get a game live in HD at, at seven thirty. You can do the same on Thursday night and Sunday afternoon. Where R- rugby union, you, it's mandatory to have pay TV for that. But you look at for th- the big thing with me, where with rugby, where I was follow followed Drew Mitchell all through his thing, had an had an invested interest in it all the way through. W- watched him go to the from the Reds to the Force back to the Tars. So we always had always had someone to watch. But it seems the big the biggest gripe with a lot of people, and I know I'm not the only one, where. The, the stop and start flow of set piece in rugby union mm. amongst like the Australian franchises where, you know, you can have three or four scrum resets, there's a penalty, they'll kick to line, get the line out set where in rugby league, the ball's in, in play a lot more, there's more frequent collision. Like, you see where I'm coming from? Oh, like, definitely. Most definitely. Like, yeah. a, a, as a casual fan, but, but is, there, is there a simple solution to, to that problem? That, like, there really isn't. Is a team folding necessarily the solution? I, I really don't know. Well, for me, I'd like to see five. You know what I mean? I'd like to see five teams here. It's the only way I think we're going to grow. But from a logistics perspective, these guys think that, that we can't really do so. Mm. But at the same time, I think there's certain elements of, you know, the NRC and, and club rugby that we can be fixing. And, you know what I mean? It, club rugby, especially in Sydney, is very much alive. Like, they're mm. getting to just not finals, but games like five, 6,000 mm. people. Like shoot, shoot Shield games down there. They're yeah. equivalent of Premier Grade. Most definitely. And there's a TV deal with that as well too. Yeah, exactly right. You can watch that on Seven Mate on a Saturday right. afternoon, the, the Shoot mm. Shield in Sydney. I think right. if you could reinvigorate a, a Premier Grade competition up here, Premier Grade rugby in, in Brisbane is a good standard. Fuck so yeah. You, yeah. If you, do you remember at when we were 9-11, 9-10-11, – to be a Premier Grade game on Friday night at Ballymore and they'd replay that on the ABC on Saturday yeah, afternoon. Definitely. That, that was yeah, like the fundamental right. of that. Yeah. Yeah. Why can't someone take that on? Mm. It would, the more that rugby is on free-to-air television, the more promotion it's going to get. Mm. So like, I'm fortunate enough to have pay TV, so I can watch, so I can watch like, both alternatives. But there's many out there that can't. So I think the structure of Super Rugby at the moment as well with three franchises where – Correct me if I'm wrong. The Brumbies are looking at making the semi-finals with a record of like five wins, ten losses. Where the poor old fucking Highlanders are over in New Zealand belting everyone else, but because they're not winning their franchise in yeah. the New Zealand conference, they're not going to make it through the finals. Like, so for any, any, anybody yeah. listening that doesn't doesn't know their rugby as mm. well as fucking the sports almanac over here, I'm um, <laughs> like t- today I was actually because like you know I haven't I haven't watched Super Rugby in years basically like we're saying because of the you know the coverage of it. And uh, and so I was doing my due diligence for the for the podcast and trying to understand the way that the conferences actually work in in the season. And I had to email Bryce and say, <laughs> "Man, I'm fucking nowhere near closer to understanding this." And 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 then he was explaining about, you know, how you basically got a team that's doing really well in one conference, but they won't get a look in because somebody else is doing 
better in their conference but not actually better than that team right. so it's a really confusing structure and and you do have is, is it the Sunwolves the the Japanese, the Japanese team side, in there yeah. now and there's an Argentine side mm-hmm. in there as well yeah. so it's expanding like what I read was they're going from 18 to 15 teams next year is that right yeah, so so they're going to lose two South Africans and at this point it looks like an Australian team as well right and which Australian team is that likely to be the it'll be the force of the rebels the rebels yeah, yeah. okay it's looking like okay. the force of, really of, of, apparently okay. from from what I from what I've heard anyway and like, who the fuck am I really but from from what sort <laughs> of you know like nah man my leads man they they're saying this shit like this shit right here man is fact like yeah. but they're saying Potentially, it could be the force, and I've seen the. I think the Rebels have signed some bloke from the UK only only recently as well. So it's like, what you're signing players from abroad? Well, if, you, if you're going to fold, like I don't know, mm. I don't think so. Like if you're yeah. reading between those lines, anyway. They're both signing, and that's the thing. Like it's it's, it's right. obviously difficult. Like it's it's, it's a crazy <laughs> thing. They're both signing guys, and you know, the ARU has to honour these deals now, especially yeah. if they're not playing next year. They still got to honour these deals. And so I don't think we're any closer to making a decision. As I said, like Bill Poole was at this conference the other day, he said they won't have a decision, you know, until at least the 31st of July. And right. It'll go well beyond that, I'd say. Right, yeah. So that, that's still only uh, six, week, six weeks away now. It's got, so the people, say if one of the franchises do fold out here, the players are still getting paid. They've got, they'll get 12 months. Yeah. If they're contracted, they'll still receive their money. So yeah. that, that's a good thing from a player's perspective where – all of a sudden, you're chopped. You're hung out to dry. And you don't have you don't have a job. But mm. if if one team was to fold, does the talent just filter out amongst the remaining franchises? Is the is that an option? Well, that that's what will happen. Yeah, a lot of those guys will obviously have to go to other Super Rugby franchises. But they're working at the moment to see if the Rugby Union Players Association they're pushing for boys to be able to choose where they go. But I think mm. the AU is a big push to try and push people where they want them to go. Right. right. So that'll be interesting to see how that all works out. And how was that for you? Like, you know, obviously an opportunity presented itself in in Japan and and you took that with both hands, but, you know, like how, um, I guess, you know, opportunities come your way and then you sort of have to make a... A judgment call about oh shit could I could I live in Japan and 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 sort of uproot yourself from obviously being a Brizzy boy and how was that sort of like culture change and just lifestyle change and everything like that for you was was that your sort of first foray into heading overseas had you done trips before that or anything or so I travelled a little bit with the Reds about night to Africa okay yeah done a few trips just with other footy uh, 19s and with brothers at Malaysia and New Zealand that kind of stuff but I spent the previous year living in the UK playing over there but. Opportunity to play. In That's right. Was that for Rotherham or R- Rotherham Tigers? Rotherham, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. up the Tigers. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking doing my research. Yeah. Yeah. Don't yeah. sleep yeah. on this. <laughs> <laughs> but when the opportunity comes up and someone says, "Do you want to live in Tokyo?" Like for me, that's just a no-brainer. Yeah. Like, like football aside, like that's just you know it's one of the best cities in the world. Yeah. For me. Like and what's genuinely. what's the main draw for you to to Tokyo, Japan? Well, I'm a big foodie, so obviously food's okay. a massive one. Right on. And I love Asian chicks. <laughs> 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 we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I need to crack yeah. another beer, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thirsty. Yeah, I'm thirsty. <laughs> but um, just the culture, like it's, there's something going on everywhere you go. Like, you yeah, know, you'll go exploring Tokyo in the center of town, and you'll find something new nearly every day. Yeah, there's so many different prefectures the, and stuff. The population of Japan in comparison to Australia. What are we? Twenty seven million or something? Twenty two. Really? Twenty two million. Oh, really? we are. Really? Oh, I don't know. I don't think we're. Is that off the last census, mate? Yeah, we yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just checked it. One hundred and twenty seven <laughs> mil. Oh man. Really. Wow, and the um, doesn't look that Let big. Me check the population of Tokyo. What's mm. what's the landmass like? That's oh, Japan there. They're packed in. I've been to Japan and love it. It's mm. amazing. I, yeah, yeah. I, it, the food and the people are just so lovely. Oh. Well, yeah, the cat just tried to jump up on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> Axed him. Sure. I always tell a story when I first got there. My my sister and my mother came along to visit, and they got lost in the center of Shinjuku, which is just like mayhem as it is, and. I live like half an hour outside and this guy kind of saw that they were lost, couldn't speak a lick of English, took him on a train, got him all the way back, dropped him my front door and then went back about his business and went back into town. Like, wow, you don't just, get that here. No, like, you it's know? just phenomenal. Just yeah. that honour amongst yeah, Japanese exactly right. as well, just a cultural difference. Like, no, this person's in need of assistance. Yeah, I'm going to help them. Yeah. Crazy. Um, the, pop- the population itself. So the you, prefecture, yeah. whatever that is. So I think it's special wards. It must be some sort of like... Category of like suburbs type of thing, but is part of the world's most popular, most populous metropolitan area with upwards of thirty seven point eight million people. Wow! And the world's largest urban agglomeration. 
agglomeration economy. economy. Yeah. Wow. Damn, Damn, that's a lot of people. That's more people in Australia than in Tokyo yeah, mm. alone. Yep. 37 is more than 22. So is there like... <laughs> <laughs> is there like, um, you know, sort of uh, rural areas and things like that that you can get into or there's just people everywhere that you go? Uh, so we lived in a rural area, so it was like Tama Center, which is you know on which was about half an hour west of Tokyo. Right, still in Tokyo Prefecture, but uh, a little bit west, and you know there was rice fields and all that kind of stuff. But basically, there's, there's people wherever you go. Like mm. it's mm. it's not more not more of a rural, but it's more of a suburb, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Schools and and that kind of stuff. Public do you, just public transport everywhere. Yeah. It, yeah. Could, couldn't see you driving around there too. Like, 37 billion million people <laughs> heading home from work no, in their cars. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, nothing. Traffic would be a, f- a nightmare. A few of the boys buy cars so they can go to town because they don't like the public transport, but I bought a scooter just to go to and from training, but mainly it's it's, it's the train, yeah. 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 The boys who bought cars didn't like getting shoved onto fucking <laughs> like <laughs> well, sardine you, yeah. can <laughs> spec. Like, it, it, you, is, there's plenty of that that happens, obviously. Like Most definitely. And they're usually the boys who are big second rollers or big number eights. The big boys. Yeah. yeah. Fair so, enough. Yeah, push yeah. me on. Push me on. Whatever. Like, oh, I, <laughs> Shout out Queensland Rail has fucking been like that of late, man. Like <laughs> driver shortage up oh, in this state. Yeah. Shocking, <laughs> man. Shocking. It's like a three carriage train for peak hour coming every half an hour. Dude, That's my under the bus yeah. for this week. Yeah, <laughs> QR. <laughs> <laughs> sort it out. Yeah. Uh, well, it it does need fixing that shit. Like honestly, they could take a leaf out of Tokyo's book. There would, there would be a train every uh, what every two minutes there. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Every couple of minutes. I saw this. Um, <laughs> I saw this. It's one of those like uh, mega factory type documentaries or whatever. You know those shows. It's yeah. like an episode on each thing. And uh, I want to say it was it was either Shanghai or Tokyo, but um, on either the world's largest or one of the world's largest train stations. And basically, they have um, these workers that live at the station twenty four seven, like it's their job. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whether they're like. Um, you know, the tile sweeper or the the actual main like um you know, manager manager yep. of the of the maintenance of the, this train station lives in this little like bunk above the train station and his alarm clock is actually like this mechanized bed that at a certain time his bed like <laughs> like comes up and pushes him out of like bed. Like a Murphy bed into the wall and <laughs> shit. <laughs> like, a, like an automatic Murphy bed that throws you out of bed in the morning. Get so up, motherfucker. You can't snooze <laughs> if you fucking wanted to. Yup. And yep. he's like, <laughs> and he's talking to the, you know, the documentary interviewer or whatever in subtitles and saying, yeah, I actually like to get up before the, before the bed <laughs> throws me yeah. out. It's not a nice feeling yeah. to like wake up yeah. with somebody just fucking hurl you out of bed. Yeah. But it was really like heartening because they're interviewing Interviewing this guy who's, whose job it is to, you know, clean the tiles or whatever. And he was saying that, like, you know, obviously you're dealing with such a huge populous fucking amount of people that you are genuinely grateful to an extreme extent for that job, you know. And he was like, I'm so happy that I have this job and I can provide for my family. It re- brings me great joy to ensure that the tiles are, like, spotlessly clean every morning. And it's like, fuck, man, it's all about perspective. Was eh? he reading off a note? Like, <laughs> yeah. did, you, did he have a knife? <laughs> did he a handgun behind the fucking camera? Like, uh, oh, yeah, shit. Yakuza? That's true, yeah. too. Yeah, That's yeah. true too. Was, yeah. um, how did you go with the language barrier in Japan? Did you take lessons for Japanese to try and get sort of street smart or yeah I think um, oh, when I was little we, we, we did Japanese so when I first got they had a bit of a grasp on it but um, so you can count s- one to ten itchy knees on cheek I mean I was sweet <laughs> <laughs> but they gave us a, a tutor and we used to have two one or two lessons every week and it kind of got us by and by the end I thought it was pretty good but you know you're never as good as you think you are no look, Drew um, Drew Mitchell he was uh we asked him that sort of same question. His French, he'd only been there for three years. His French was fucking terrible. <laughs> <laughs> was I, was awesome. listening, I was listening to a podcast during the week where they were saying that if you haven't, uh, when it comes to music and languages, if you haven't learnt them before puberty, you will never be like of a certain state. Like you'll never be fluent enough that somebody from that particular language group won't be able to tell that you're not from somewhere else. Yeah. But if you say, you know, you learn Spanish or Portuguese or whatever it may be before puberty 
then you like as as whatever could go to Portugal and people would be like, oh, you're Portuguese. Like they they can't tell the difference, you know. Is that really? to do with the development period? Something to do with yeah. the you Around know that the, time? the development of the mm. brain and stuff like that. And it's like the you know can't teach an old dog new tricks type mm. of thing, which is there would be an element of fluidity to someone who's learnt it from childhood as yeah. to all right, I'm gonna get uh, I'm gonna do Spanish. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Como gonna... esta? <laughs> like, yeah, it just sounds yeah. awful. You get divorced at 58 and you start Spanish and piano lessons. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to buy a convertible and I'm going to get a fucking... I'm going to learn Spanish, man. Coma Watch starts. Yeah. <laughs> Hola, chica. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Buenos dias, my friend. Uh, and so, so rugby's afforded you, like, you know, travel to um, to Japan and, and, and I guess you sort of can base yourself from there and I, I'll, I'll admit that I was creeping your Instagram today and it looks like you've done a bit of other travel and shit like that, so... It's sort of like, uh, I guess it's it's something that like, you know, us boys, well, Moylie's had a bit of a different row. He's done he's done time in the in the army and stuff like that. But, you know, Maddie and I just, you know, work work nine to five type jobs. And, and the idea of being able to get paid to do something you love in, in professional sport and, and rugby and, you know, whatever it may be, you know, how, how was that sort of, was that like somewhat a dream come true when you, you know, you're traveling the world and going to these different places and it's like, oh, well, I need to go make cheddar by, you know, doing something that I really love and hanging out with the boys sort of thing. Like, I think, um, yeah, for me, that's what it was. Like, it, it was a dream come true. Like, yeah. I woke up every morning and I mm. literally jumped out of bed because I decided to go. And Did you have one of those, bed. like, Murphy beds? <laughs> 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 well, yeah, yeah, I literally jumped out of bed because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the fucking alarm was going to yeah, go yeah, off yeah. in half an hour. And yeah. Yeah. It just comes fitted standard over there. <laughs> <laughs> My unit was furnished. Get <laughs> out. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> uh, but, no, that's how I kind of looked at it. And it was yeah. an opportunity for me to see the world and, you know what I mean, like, it, it wasn't about the footy, but as much as I, I loved doing it, it was, it was the opportunity that was presenting itself and I loved every minute of it. What about what about well, that kitty, fan? This kitty cat up in this shit. I love it. <laughs> what about the fan base there? Are they they're pretty fanatical or yeah. they very respectful? It, it's, it's a weird one. Like they they don't kind of they chant and, and they get up, but like it's 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 not as intense as as it kind of is here. But they're very polite and they sit down and they watch the game. But the they have a small base. You know what I mean? The rugby community over there. It's it's mm. not large, but they are very fanatical. Like they, yep. they, they they love it. They turn up and they go to their games. But the interesting part about it is, is the teams over there, they're companies. You know what I mean? Mm. So I play for Canon, which is obviously the camera and the printers oh, and the photo got companies. It. Honda Heat. Right. Yeah, the uh, Honda yep. Heat. Oh, okay. Um, yep. Panasonic, yep. Coca Cola, and Kobe right. Steel, and all those kind of guys and Suntory whiskey yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And is that a whiskey Suntory? That, that mm. Matty, Matt Guido has finished up at Toulon. He's going to uh, Suntory Sunglyth right, over right. there now. So That's the whole premise of that uh, Lost in Translation movie. If you haven't seen that, get amongst it. It's Bill Murray and uh, yeah. Scarlett Johansson. Really? <laughs> he right. basically plays, plays this like, you know, washed up Hollywood actor that's going to Japan to do whiskey ads. And she's <laughs> like, yeah. he's basically just depressed with the whole thing and he's having to do this. For relaxing times, mm-hmm. make it Centuri time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> like yeah, like, right. But he meets this like girl. Man, fuck, it's it's a beast of a movie. Go oh, see man. it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but that's interesting though. That like you know, it's it's it seems synonymous with with Japanese culture. That you know, advertising and 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 big city and it mm. it makes perfect sense that their their teams would be named after yeah, companies. You know, baseball enormous, massive. Yep. Mm. Baseball, uh, soccer, soccer like as it's, well. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And then you got the sumo, obviously. Yeah. Ever, did you ever go to any of that? Yeah, I went well, to sumo. Like we sort of sumo. martial arts. Any chunk or nabi? Chunk <laughs> 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 Navi, we watched this Vice documentary on one of these uh, sumo wrestlers, and it's like <laughs> basically the sumo diet. So it's like a crock pot that's dead set. Fucking for the listeners at home, it's like ten inches off off sort of the tabletop and and the size of a full bowl. And um, and it's just it's not actually that bad. It's just a whole bunch of like herbs and spices and vegetables and meat. But they yeah, have to basically, you know, speaking of bulking up, they have to eat chunk or nabi and sleep. That's yeah. basically what <laughs> they do You'll to eat, train. Eat you know? this saucepan full and just go back to bed. Yeah. You're like, oh, you ain't. <laughs> he's, there, he, he's there like <laughs> cooking the chunk or nabi, just sweating a storm man. like. But it had had himself a hot little bird there as well. So yeah. like, <laughs> sure. like they're, super, they're super they're like rock star status Absolutely. over there. The sumos, yeah. yeah. Yeah, very much so. That's just crazy. Such a, a crazy concept in terms of like the modern day modern day martial artists, where you get mixed martial arts, boxing, like McGregor Mayweather getting put together this week has just broken the internet with every, everyone talking about mm. that. 
when you go something back as what it seems as simple as sumo wrestling out here is still enormous in that uh, in amongst Japanese a tradi- culture. A, yeah. a tradition, a really strongly traditional sort of thing, yeah. But um, yeah, I fucking I'd love to go to Japan. I've had you know a little bit of experience snowboarding and stuff like that. So yeah. I think um, you know Hakuba is is a place I'd love to go. Did you get into any of the sort of winter sports and stuff like that over there? Or I didn't because of my knees and obviously playing footy. Okay, and yeah, fair enough. But all my mates would always. Like, <laughs> hey, hey, just, hey coach, I've just blown out my fucking ACL, <laughs> man. So, I was doing some black run. I was doing some, <laughs> was doing some, some downhill biking. <laughs> 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 Downhill biking was one that I didn't fuck with. You, yeah. you like mm. Moily and uh, and Briss got into it a little bit when we were in in Canada. But for me, that was one of those. that's like the injury mm. factor is not worth the enjoyment factor. <laughs> it's real. Like we went we went up on on the first day. Kyle took a couple of mad beatings. Get home and just out of I was like, what, what date is it actually? Because I'd I'd gone over there. Open ended ticket, but my travel insurance was only for six months. And I was like, Oh, I might get, I'm not going to pay for 12 months. I might get there and hate it. Like, I might, you know, who knows? It's like, I got there and I fucking loved it. But on sit, go home, it's like, man, I just rode all day up there. And I've never done downhill mountain biking in my life, man. I got, <laughs> got to the point where my, my hands, like the muscles gave out in my hands from hanging onto the handlebars. So, so we went hard. so high. It, it, so, yeah, like, like, we let's took just go like to three the top. fucking yeah. lifts to get yeah. up to the yeah. top. <laughs> just chill, we just saw chill, snow, chill. man. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was middle of summer and was, yeah. we're up at the peak starting down. We're like, oh, well, we've seen a couple of these green ones. That just seems like a, like more like a fucking nature ride sort of thing. So we'll go to these blue ones and it's straight up like tabletops and jumps and shit. Get home and then check on the internet that I don't have travel insurance for that day. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit! Like. I remember meeting you guys at the pub after that day because it was your first day downhill biking, and I don't know whether it was the altitude or the dust or something. Both, mate. But Maddie's voice, the way that you're hearing it now, it was very different. It was like he broke his voice. It was, and it was this. It was this yeah. real strange sounding thing. Like it always sounded like you were holding. Your nose. <laughs> I'm, I'm, like, na- yeah. I'm nasally at the and it best. Like, this was. Uh, <laughs> I just met these boys and I was like, what the fuck. Like having your voice, oh, man. but it was a, it was a ridiculous cardio workout as well. Yeah. You're basically holding a squat on a bike while tensing up your whole body out of fear. Oh. Well, you're shitting yourself. Yeah. Your ass, yeah. your ass puckers. Everything it's was sore, but I, I was breathing so hard from just being so tense the whole time. It was like like going into a fist fight and just seizing up out, out of nerves. Like I was nervous the whole day, but my, just from heavy breathing and maybe like a bit of dirt. Who knows? But my voice was ruined, and I'd only just met met a chick over there that I was that I was keen on. I'm like, this is only like the, like I'd met her the 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 weekend where Kyle had come over was Canada Day long weekend, so I was like, met this chick out and I'm like, no, I'm keen to see her again and then turn up, hey babe, like, <laughs> you know, my like, voice was absolutely fucked, but she still she, loved she, it. Yeah, she didn't didn't hate it and now is the Good. mother of my child. Like fuck that night, but didn't knock her up that night. But oh my God, that, that, that came uh, that came years. No, that later. was actually three weeks ago. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> I heard a, a rumor coming fresh out of Japan, and, and this, you know, one of your teammates might have told you as well. You don't have to implicate yourself in, in anything here as well. But a guy that I know who who had lived in Japan said, amongst Japanese women, there was no such thing as a one night stand. To the point where you would go out, meet a girl at the fucking disco, karaoke bar, wh- wherever you were <laughs> over dinner. Go out, me- meet a traditional Japanese girl, born and bred. Go out, have relations with that girl that evening. So say it's a Saturday night, take her back to your house, she leaves, you go to her place Sunday evening, she'll prepare you a meal, sleep together again and she basically sort of like presents what, what she can offer as as the woman, you know what I right. mean? You get to go over, you can see the meal she prepares, the home that she provides, things like that. Is it any truth to that or does this dude just <laughs> having to meet a couple of freaky <laughs> birds and he ended up having two nights with like, yeah. I can tell you off air who that was too. Like. <laughs> yeah, well, no, nah, for me, like, they don't, well, I, I experienced one night stands, but it's, nice. it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's certainly, uh, it's a different experience and I'll, I'll kind of talk you through that. So, good. The one yeah. I- <laughs> nice and slow now. Yeah. Nice and slow. <laughs> we ain't in no rush, son. <laughs> Cole's taking off his jacket. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting so hot yeah, in here. Yeah. <laughs> Is this thing on? <laughs> <laughs> so we would uh, we would go out to Rapongi. We'd frequent Rapongi a fair bit, which is like the center of Tokyo, and it's you know where all the foreigners go, and it's it's a great place. It really is. There's some fantastic bars along there, but 
usually what would happen is you'd, you'd, you'd talk to a few Japanese girls and you'd talk to a group of them and then you'd take them home but they'd always bring a friend. And so you'd sit there and Three way <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're thinking <laughs> like, Man this is too fucking easy <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you, yeah, sure. sure baby Whatever makes you feel comfortable <laughs> just, just Can I bring as, a friend yeah. Just yeah, as long yeah. as you feel safe baby <laughs> <laughs> And meanwhile like you're obviously talking in, in, in broken English and, and, and doing your best Japanese And all yeah. that kind of stuff they were loving it too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <They> lo- <laughs> and you kind of sit there and you, and you converse with them for, I reckon, probably two hours at back of your apartment. Meanwhile, it's like, you know, three or four o'clock in the morning. You're like, you know, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm fucking tired, <laughs> man. This is <laughs> epic. <laughs> but anyway, so, you, you know, it was, it was nice. And you sit there and then eventually they have a conversation and one friend gets up and goes, you know, okay, I'm going now. I'll see you later. So one friend leaves. And you're like, no, you're the one I wanted. <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. man. <laughs> and then... Um, Damn it. Then oh, well, the, we're here now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just hit this. <laughs> and then they, uh, uh, they take you for a shower. And so you must shower before. This is from my experience. It might be different, you know what I mean? But every time I had an experience, you, you shower and yeah, then right. you go inside and you obviously do the Have deed. relations. You, you have relations and then... Um, you both shower? Yeah, yeah, so you have to shower together. Together. Oh, yeah. okay. A cleanse? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not mad at that at all. Bad. Get that disco ball yeah. time in. It was just like, nah, man, yeah. Summer, summertime, you're on the dance floor at the family, like, fucking, you come with me. It's like, we've been getting a sweat on for the last four and a half hours. Like, Japan sounds good. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> and then you shower again after. So, like, for me, like, I'm a pretty clean person, but I was right about it. Mm. Yeah. Good. I like yeah. that. Absolutely. Yeah. I like that. There so the heat turns on in the shower, though, you know? Is, is that <laughs> no, right? It's, 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 it's more of a, a cleansing process, I think. It's more of a, a clean thing. You, mm. know, you know what I mean? You wash my back first, babe? Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> like, yeah, we're in a relationship already. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got that goosh, bro. It's always, it's always an interesting one, like, uh, when, when there is, like, a genuine romantic connection or lust or sex or whatever you want to call it, sort of, um, you know, when you, when you can... Tell that something's going on between two people, but there's a huge language barrier, and it's like you have to try and overcome this. Like, w- and it's so difficult. It's just like it's a really interesting thing when you completely take language out of the e- equation of communication, and it's like we have to communicate on a on a completely other, th- yeah. like you know, different level. Just trying to allude to them that you've got a heart on, like, <laughs> like, trying to be somewhat subtle. Like, am yeah. I right? Like, yeah. <laughs> See this? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You down? You down? <laughs> yeah. like. uh, oh, what's yes? <laughs> hey. 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 So no two night things though. Like it wasn't. It was okay. You know we've we've cleansed together. That yeah. Was no, great. that was like, that was basically it. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. you know, in um, in Japanese culture, another thing that I've heard is basically um, like if you're a girl's partner, you won't get brought home till the father until you're like legit getting married or. Maybe the day of the wedding or, or meet, prior meet or something. the old man on the day. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Well, it's like in, in Japanese culture, you don't bring, you know, X, Y, Z boyfriend home to meet dad or that, that didn't work out. It's like it's only the one that you're going to marry that comes home to meet dad. So it's like because I've, I've got like a, a couple of mates, Aussie mates that, that have been in or are in relationships with Japanese girls and it's, the, you know, the, the father-in-law situation is a fucking big deal, you know? Big ball, like... With, an e- uh, with a language barrier potentially yeah. in the way as well, that could be a hard thing to handle. Yeah, I mean, it's a stereotype, the whole in-law situation, and it's it's always the fucking roll of the dice. You just hope that you don't meet some, like, awesome chick whose who's parents happen to be absolute fucking hard work. <laughs> Cheryl's dad off married at first sight. <laughs> like, for all you real- reality TV fans out there. Uh. So, do you see... Oh, I want to throw her under the bus this week, too. There was... Do you ever watch Married at First Sight out here? No. no. no, no. <laughs> it, it was good, mate. Like, really good. Like, yeah, you missed out, man. It was just a reality TV program. But they're talking about people with their 15 minutes of fame and, and trying to stay relevant. Yeah. Huge and, uh, 15 minutes of fame type uh, trash TV. For sure. Yeah. Went went from being uh, an alleged, like, titty waitress for Bucks parties and stuff onto this TV program and got a bit of notoriety out of it. And now he's texting on Instagram someone from a paparazzi agency in, in Melbourne. Like, hey, listen, uh, just want to give you the shout-out. Um, 
I'm on the 1015 flight from uh, from Brisbane, so I'll be landing at the airport and I'm um, seeing this dude down here. So if you want to come out, get some snaps, uh, that, that'd that be cool. But if not, you know, we've got a dinner booking at Rockpool for uh, for 6.30. So, you know, we've, I've asked the, for the window table so you can maybe get us through, get us through the window. And this guy's like... Uh, no, mate. Who the, who the fuck <laughs> are you? Like, uh, sorry? Like... Sorry, and has got come out and put her on blast, like on his yeah, own good. Instagram. So like, just, just the the ego on on some people like that too. But um, <laughs> fuck me. Yeah, no, shout out uh, hot like a sunrise. Is that her Instagram name? No, I'm blocked, man. <laughs> 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 Gave him my two cents worth. Yeah. And it was like, nah, nah. nah. <laughs> We've got those Marsh sisters on there. Block me as well. <laughs> <laughs> It's a crazy world, though, you know. Like it's it's this um, it's this age of self promotion where like I'll like hundred percent put my hand up and say I'm all over Instagram. I love that shit. It's like a a legit addiction or whatever you want to call it. But basically, first thing in the morning, I wake up, take a shit, check my Instagram. Like that's that's my morning ritual. You know, the same as my my old man gets up every day and re- and reads the Courier. Like that's mm. that's his morning ritual. I get on the Instagram. I get on Instagram and look at. Probably tits Twerk, and ass, yeah, yeah, <laughs> surfing <laughs> pics, <Nice. laughs> and uh, and and like yeah, it's just it's a real weird kind of paradigm that we live in, and I think there's there's hel- healthy use of it, and then there's then there's the other extreme where oh. it's like, hey, can you come take a photo of me because I want to be famous, like yeah. for this reality TV show that I went on, and it's like, what are you really doing here? Like, are you kicking goals? Are you you know what what is it that you're chasing here, or is it just the fame? Like straight up. And I guess, yeah, like, you know, sports stars are are an interesting one because they're they're ones that are in the public eye and not necessarily always, you know, because they want to be. It's like a a skill that you learn and and all that sort of stuff. But, fuck, I guess it's like, you know, we're seeing this this Mayweather, Conor McGregor shit go down now and if if you're not out there sort of chasing that status, then then you're not getting this $100 million paycheck that fucking... Connor standing up for. I mean, what's what's your thoughts on that, Briss? That's fucking huge news that's just come out in the last couple of days that we've officially mm. we've officially signed on for uh, MMA versus boxing match. Although it is a boxing match um, versus the current light and featherweight champion in Connor Connor the notorious one McGregor um, versus Floyd Money Money May- Mayweather. What's your thoughts? August twenty fifth. 26. Uh, it'll be the 27th, 27th yeah, Saturday night in Vegas, so it's Aussies. Sunday the 27th out here. It's one of the one of those much must see events. Like we've talked talked about it on the podcast before, but it's so good to finally have an end date in sight now too. Where they, they've talked about it for basically the be, the best part of 12 months. There's been sort of rumours and speculation where you'll get comments from one guy from one side, like Mayweather will come out and ch- mention Connor's name, vice versa for Connor on the side talking about Floyd. What Floyd does. And he has done in in the past, and it's I, I personally think it's a good way to do it. Is once he announces his fight, he, he will choose a date, and it's only eight weeks away. Where in, in the UFC model, we're talking about you know George Saint Pierre potentially fighting Michael Bisping at the end of November. So mm. we're we're now we're in June. So we're, we're five months away from watching that. Lots of speculation. This is eight weeks away. Like mm. it's on. So and it's almost good too because it's sort of. It is the freak fight that is, that's been put together and it's the social media, in, in my opinion, has had a huge influence on, on this getting done just with everyone, everyone chiming in with their two cents worth. And since it's been announced, like, there is the absolute casual fan, like everyone in, who has Instagram or any sort of social media knows that this on and they're weighing in on it. So mm. it's, I think it just sells absolutely massive, whether it's a mismatch or not, I don't know. I've, I've always said Floyd wins and, and I still think that's the case, but... They're both winners because they're both absolutely fucking cleaning up here for one night's work. Connor's going to earn 10 to 15 times more than he's ever earned through any of his mixed martial arts fights. He could walk away with $100 million here mm. and get to cool. Yeah. Like, he, he, he could come out. This would be the easiest money he's made, and, and credit to him. There's videos back from 2015 where he's manifesting this shit. Like, he's thought this in his own mind, and he's brought it to fruition, and he's always said, I'm going to get in, get rich, and get out. And this is his ticket to that. With it's arguably an, an easier night. Like he's got, from a UFC point of view, he's got Khabib Namagamadov and Tony Ferguson waiting for him, who were well rounded as fuck on the ground and could potentially take this guy down and just beat his fucking face into oblivion or mm. rip one of his arms off in a, in a submission, shit like that. Where Floyd's only going to box him up. Like at worst, he gets knocked out. Like yeah, at, at worst. So. Mm. 
Unbelievable. I'm just so glad it's finally happened. Do you, do you watch much fighting yourself, Dale? Or you, for, uh, even as a casual, this fight I'm not, garnered, garners interest. Yeah, like I'll obviously watch this. Like it's a spectacle, isn't it? And mm, it's, yeah. it's, it's what it is. You know what I mean? I don't really care who wins, but I'd like to see the whole event happen as I yeah. think most of the public would. Mm. But I'm not big into my fighting. Like I've got a few mates who really love it, but for me it's, it's a bit, bit boring. From, from, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> from, the, from the usual. Like, yeah. nah. see, see, I would like uh, in the literally the probably handful of boxing fights that I've actually watched, one of which was um, Money fucking Manny Pacquiao, yeah. which is arguably one of the biggest fights that – like biggest boxing fights to this date, and I found it fucking boring as bad shit as yeah. well. To be completely honest, Which it probably was. I'm, too, I'm right? obviously a, um, a a pretty big UFC and and MMA fan, and I find that quite an exciting sort of um, sporting type. So it'll be interesting to see what this this goes like, man. Because you know the boxing format for me, like you're saying, Dale, is, is isn't you know such an interesting one for me, but. Um, I'd fucking love to see him have a real fight. Mm. Yeah, it could be a fucking gross mismatch on that side as but well. But for me, too. and I've sort of said it on, on the podcast before as well, is that the promo of this one is almost going to dwarf the fight for mine, you know, mm. because these we're talking about two A-plus shit talkers mm. and, and fucking nothing sells tickets more than two people talking shit. And I can't wait to hear some of the fucking banter that I comes know. out between, mm. you know... Money, who's you know a brash American, African American, mm-hmm. fucking like who's you know arguably would he be the the most wealthy athlete on on planet Earth? Fuck, he'd be right he'd up. Be there. Up he'd be right up there. With yeah. the Cristiano Ronaldo, with Messi, with like fucking that. basically you know Brad Pitt out of snatch, fucking Conor McGregor, like. <laughs> With one liners fucking coming out of his hair, you know, which and he needs uh, to be careful of as well. Like Connor has only ever fought one African American in his in his UFC reign. <laughs> what did he and come, he's out, come today? out today? With uh, Floyd looks like a Malteser with eyes, and it's like, can you say uh, that? I like, don't know if he can. can, can you man, you say that, he man? definitely like, can. I'm glad you're here, you man. Tread lightly, <laughs> like, he's had no, like with um, he's dropped um calling Nate Diaz a cholo and stuff, which is apparently can be derogatory amongst mm. Latin Americans and stuff too. So it needs, to, needs to tread a fine line, but the more shit he talks, more mm. potential... Say, say if he did go out with some enormous racial slur, there's just going to be more people from that mm. demographic watching to try and see Floyd whoop his ass. So what sort of promo do we get out of this? Because I haven't seen a single UFC like no. logo on Zip. any of that. And, and, and there won't be mm. too. Won't they, be. Dana, I watched this thing last night with Dana White where he, he'd confirmed that... This is a Showtime production where they'll get you'll get a, a what they call twenty four seven, which yeah. would be same thing as a UFC countdown. Like UFC got on that model when, like the ones with with Floyd was basically a reality show about Mayweather, where you get you know him, him with his like extravagance and all that sort of shit. So the countdown will be all time. There will be a press conference at, at one point two for sure, and then get to, get to fight week and then sort of media <sighs> and stare downs. Like you've done, Don't have Co- long Kyle's to had wait, done, man. no. That's the best part about it. Kyle's mm. done. Uh, a bit of bit of boxing at um, yeah I- in his time like do do you have a take what is it a mismatch in your eyes or do you give yeah. Connor a chance or? no definitely it's a mismatch uh, I I see uh, Connor maybe landing a couple or if he can but it's it's going to be uh, Floyd is just uh, clinical man he is cl- so clinical and he's so sharp and I just don't think um, Could it's be good a speed difference for me. Oh yeah, yeah, speed. If anything, like uh, I mean, the age gap. But I still think it's Floyd, yeah. um, hands down. Yeah, it, it, it's got to be early. If Connor can't, if Connor's going to win, it's going to catch him early, and he's going to drop him or shock him. You know, and but if it goes the rounds, it's no way, yeah, no I, way. Like, Con- Connor on a. 10 round points decision Is it 10 or 12 rounds I, I oh, thought it might have been 12 so. it's Regardless of what 12. it is like You couldn't see Conor McGregor as In his first ever boxing fight Coming out and out Pointing uh, no, Floyd no, I, I just don't no think no That's going to happen If he's going to stop If he wins He has to stop yeah. like, And he, the, uh, the weight's been confirmed At 154 pounds It is too which, which surprised me in a way As well Where Floyd He's had a lot of success At 147 And it mightn't seem like A lot of difference Between 154 to 147 But in combat sports That absolutely is Where if you've seen McGregor at 145 pounds, looks like he's straight out of a concentration camp. Like right? mm. to get to get this weight off him is just a straight up bag of bones. But I thought Floyd might have tried to get him to 150, like make him take some weight off before he does it. But but at the same time, I 
think he may be that confident where he's like, wait, wait, yeah, he's like, he weight's, not, weight's not going to matter. You can yeah. come, you can weigh 165 if you want. I'm going like, to fight you skill, now. The skill set here will, yeah. will be the difference. So, yeah, I, I really don't know. About Do you think if you took money out of the equation altogether, you would choose uh, an individual sport such as, you know, like fighting, tennis, what, what it, golf, whatever it may be, or you, or you would go a team sport? Ooh. Probably a team sport, you know. Put put me in as fucking Tom Brady or someone like that in that <laughs> sort of in that or Derek Jeter in baseball. If you could be an absolute superstar, I think it'd have to be a team sport because you get that camaraderie of mateship as well. Like you've you've been there, you've done it. Like the, yeah. the team sports is the uh, is the go. I think we uh, we posed this question to our mates the other day. I was like, if you could win any sporting event in the world, what would you win? And I think for me, it's got to be a team sport. Sure. Like obviously, the celebration after is. You know, pretty special, but like to look back and think like we've done this together. It's yeah. not just me. Yeah. For me, that's more fulfilling. You know mm. what I mean? And that's just me because what were what, what were your answers? answers? Yeah. What was some answers? Well, a lot of boys said like fastest man in the world. Obviously, like every four years, for the next four years, you got bragging rights. You are the fastest yeah. man in the world. Um, Super Bowl was a big one. Obviously, yeah. there's American sports because, let's be honest, those parties are obviously going pretty mad. Definitely. Mm. Um, and they're the biggest sporting events in the world, aren't they? But um, that was basically it. Like no one was really. Anything out of the ordinary? Super been 15. To, uh, been to any, speaking of party celebrations, any uh, Mad Mondays? You willing to share any sort of fun, <laughs> fun, fun, event, fun events? No one's going to get thrown <laughs> under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mr. No, no, X no, and yeah, yeah, Mrs. Yeah, y. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. X who played open side in our premiership. <laughs> 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 I'm, willing, I'm willing to share one as well about a, uh, a connection that I had through the Brothers Rugby Club actually too. Very close connection too, so you make of that what you will. Um, <laughs> Breakfast Creek in Brisbane for for everyone who who hasn't seen it. There's a there's a creek, historic pub in Brisbane on the corner. There's a bridge that goes over over the R- Brisbane River that runs through like adjacent to it. So this guy after might might have lost a, I think he might have won a Colts premiership on the Sunday. Goes through into Mad Monday, uh, strips off naked, sprints onto the Breakfast Creek, which is. Four lanes of traffic in, in peak hour, squats over the edge of the bridge, defecates off the bridge into the water and dives in after it at like three o'clock in the afternoon. So three that's, o'clock uh, in the afternoon. That's that. No one's just doing that in individual sports. <laughs> no, you know exactly. what I mean? If you, win, you win the fucking British Open in golf, you're not going to go shit off the local <laughs> bridge. Like, it's just not going to fucking happen. Uh, but team sports, it's like just that sort of environment where I, 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 I miss that, in, that camaraderie of team sports. Like, this will pale in comparison to anyone that's like any sort of sporting achievement. We want an Oztag premiership once <laughs> where Oz, Oztag, the old sort of like flag football where you rip, rip the tags off the side of people's shorts to get touched. But this was just, just a social group of boys and at the end of the season you won, I think you won $1,500 and the, the idea of that was just reinvest to register your team for the next year. We were like 19, 20, like a couple of guys <laughs> late 20s like... No, 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 the cash. Like they weren't we're, making it, yeah, yeah. we're making it rain <laughs> tonight. They, they weren't happy about it either. This was our Stafford Oztag too, so go fuck we yourselves. The cash. <laughs> they, <laughs> dead set. These guys, they, they handed uh, over the cash and had the biggest bender at a, a house that only a couple of streets away from, from this very studio to the point where people... Um, People put boxing gloves on that night and fucking threw, threw down <laughs> out, out the back and everything. Just, but that's... That camaraderie and celebration, I still remember that as one of the, like, the, the best memories I've had in team sports only because I was old enough to be able to go and get on the piss. Where yeah. I've had fun all through high school sports and that, but you know, you go to a first 15 party, your mum and dad let you take six beers. So <laughs> where, th- this time, open slather for three days. So. Yeah. yeah, it's funny, man. I was um, up late last night watching the footy show and even, even those boys, you know, they're all our age or older, like I'm watching JT... Jonathan Thurston just, um, you know, interviewing a few of the boys in the in the Origin camp and stuff like that. And it's like, fuck, man, this is no different to when we were 17, you know? Like, there's still the same. Yeah, like, leagues, man. For the, <laughs> for the boys, you know? Yeah. Like, just having a fucking mad time, like, so much banter. And I, and I like, remarked to my missus at the time, I was like, fuck, what a fun life that mu- they must live, you know? Like, sure, there's injuries and there's controversy and... You know, you have to deal with having a, a reputation in places you go and people putting pulling a camera phone out every time you're pissed or mm. whatever. But uh, but fuck, man, like it must it must be a fun lifestyle. And obviously you can attest to that, you know, like living. So when you're in Japan and stuff, are you sort of share housing with a few of the boys or is there a camp as such or how does it sort of work like accommodation wise, I guess? 
So we just, we, everyone was given their own apartment. So two or three, three bedroom apartment. We all live in the same block. And then Sick. from there, you just kind of run them up. Yeah, that's one thing I think <laughs> those guys do really well is they look after you. Yeah. That's why it's, it's, it's a great place to go. Like we talked before about food, like they feed you lunch and dinner. You don't have to worry about anything. You've got this wonderful two, three bedroom apartment, in, you know, in Tokyo and you can... You know, it's it's enjoyable. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it's it's a great place. And just you're there, up. having a shower every night with. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Man, I got so sweaty today. <laughs> we, we're gonna need to cleanse. Like, we got that co shower coming <laughs> <Yeah>. up. <laughs> that big stand up shower. Hey baby, you wanna have a shower? Seems <laughs> <laughs> so. Cool. We just shower, man. <laughs> I really like. Hey baby, it. it's yeah. three a.m. Do you reckon we could take a shower? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> want a tub Super up. polite, yeah. like culture. Well, you I know, that's what it's like too. It is. Dead set. Uh, <laughs> so how teammates living in a block party like that, that just sounds unbelievable yeah, it's unreal. Right, too. Fuck Most yeah. definitely. That's the life, man. So uh, question, how many times have you broken your nose? Oh, three. Oh, I, can, <laughs> I can tell, <laughs> mate. <laughs> it is it is right off. Yeah, <laughs> it's, so it's the one side I can't breathe out of. Yeah, oh, man. Yeah, really dead set. Good, no, I joined the club, man. Yeah, <laughs> I think I've broken mine twice. What once confirmed and then another time. There's nothing they do for a broken no. nose, right? You just yeah, you just, just don't blow it. Yeah. Don't <laughs> blow your nose when you got a broken nose. Mm. Your eyes just look like you've been have some bee allergy, and you've yeah. just been had your face stung by a lot. Like when I played, when I played a bit of rugby during high school, I was basically the Stephen Larkham of, <laughs> of um, <laughs> injuries. Held together with tape, like. <laughs> you know, like broke my sternum twice. Like wow. sternum's a fucking nasty one to break. Talk about you don't want to do something is sneeze. <laughs> You like when you break your sternum, you know because you basically have this pencil line purple bruise that comes up between, like basically in a in a vertical line down your down your rib cage. So I would have been at the bottom of a like ruck or mall or something, and then you know somebody three times my size just squished me. Oh, but yeah. but um, did collarbones, did elbows, a lot of fingers. <clears throat> You've said it's um it's a fucking tough game, man. Like I tagged the boys in something today that was like anyone who's grown up in you know, on the east coast of Australia and has played whatever footy has fucking witnessed a bit of run at me's at like different different stages like high school, you know, like run straight or fucking or like after school even worse, add a few beers into the mix and, and there's some people that just have this ability to be able to stand their ground and fucking wow. shot people <laughs> like crazy. No arms involved basically, just... That shout out uh, a fella from St. Pat's, Clayton Howitt, man. He he used to be able to put on some fucking shots. And I swear it's all just angles or something, you know, because there's some guys and I should... I, fuck, I wish I could bring this video up on the screen, but fucking some big hits, man. <laughs> hey, like... Best um, best hit man you've played with? Any, anyone that stands out from over the years, whether it's Reds, Rotherham, clean hitter? Oh, it's a tough one. Um, one... Juan Pablo Sosinho plays for Newcastle now. He was pretty good. Right. Just clean. Yep. Really clean. It's a timing mm. thing with shotting yeah. like that. Absolutely. It is. Yep. Yeah. Where a lot of these guys on this video were, that, that Danny had tagged us in where these guys can always just stand their ground and it is just timing it clean where you don't necessarily – someone's coming forward at you running straight so you can just time their balance where they yeah. just happen to be off step. That sort of – Standard Sonny Bill Williams, like he's one of the best exponents. Where their out. momentum almost works against them mm, yeah. because they've come in so hard <laughs> and you, and like you or whoever <laughs> hit, hits it at that right angle they that, do. fuck, I don't know if you, do you know Kimbo Slice? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so growing oh, up, like there was a whole, bun- up, whole oh bunch of internet God. videos of, um, of Kimbo Slice getting in backyard fights and stuff like that. And basically there's this one where... They've obviously paid a guy some cash, and I think it's like at the halftime of some NFL. Nah, it's comp- just in a park. It's in yeah, a park right. in Miami. You know, they just dress Kimbo up in a uh, in full NFL outfit and just throw this guy a hospital ball. They just lob <laughs> one to him. It's, it's, not, it's not from Money Talks, is it? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe you might have seen it. <laughs> yeah, 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 it, it is. It is. Yeah. 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 It's on point. Yeah. Yeah. Nine years ago, oh, feel old fan. Five, yeah, five and a half million views. Rest in peace, Kimbo Slice. It's so this slice is called talk. this is Money Talks Kimbo Slice Football Tackle, and oh, this is like man. Kimbo is full of sauce here. I would almost, uh, almost guarantee. Full of that. Those Mexican supplements. So they. They're bartering this guy up, so they yeah, you'll be right, man. Don't lob- worry about it. You're in full NFL gear, and this guy just lobs in the most <laughs> thumbs up, <laughs> the most hospital pass you've ever seen for a Kimbo off the long run to just oh, this guy just gets in a small car accident. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, 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 the timing of it. It's perfect. Nice. Oh my. 
Jesus Christ. Slice. <laughs> slice wins. Kimbo. Kimbo slice. It, wow, no. Tr- you got to get that slow-mo. The slow-mo, yeah. yeah. Instant replay. <laughs> oh, no. Folded in half. <laughs> oh, he was like on his off, off step as well, so both <laughs> feet were off the ground. Oh. <laughs> they overthrew the pass on him. Oh, was, oh, that fuck. led him in. Reached for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he led him onto that. Fuck I think they've hell. actually, you know, measured the velocity of some of these tackles and it is parallel to getting in a car accident. It like is. Like it's yeah, yeah. fucking you know, John Brinkus. Kim- Kimbo at... 230 pounds at that point, whatever he was, bang, surging at a sprint. Like, Cole, you're the, uh, the physics mage. You'd probably be able to work. <laughs> if we gave you enough time, you'd be able to work it out. So uh, go. Go. 230 pounds, moving better. at 15 miles an hour uh, into a 185-pound man. <laughs> go. Uh, that is uh, 2,500 Newton foot. No, I don't know. <laughs> 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 like, fuck we like, did. Yeah, you like that? Yeah, <laughs> not fucking goodwill hunting. <laughs> no, <like. laughs> no, but oh, it's enough to get fucked up. Yeah. 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 How much goodwill hunting? How much though? How much for you to take that tackle? To, for somebody oh, to throw you a ball man. that's in front of you. More so than that, bloke <laughs> got. More than that, dude. What you got, like a, get? That'd be you got a hundred bucks. How much did he get? Hundred bucks. No. Fuck that. But no, nah, but they gave uh, him a helmet, man. <laughs> <laughs> and he just break, he yeah. collapses your rib cage. Like. <laughs> Mate, he did too. Could have folded you in half. There. Would you rather take some body line? Take some speed? Yeah, probably. I'd, I'd rather face a cricket yeah. ball than that. Definitely. Yep. Well, no, yeah, 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 cricket yeah, sure. ball sting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah, it oh, it does. <laughs> the, the hard leather there yeah. just pressed like that. The cr- <laughs> with a seam on it too. That, people forget about that with a cricket ball, but... I remember um, Piers Morgan, the um, famous British like <laughs> yeah. media personality, he talked a bunch of shit about Brett Lee on Twitter <laughs> and, uh, out here a couple of summers ago. And Brett Lee uh, goes, all right, got well, it. If, you're so, uh, <laughs> if you're so good, mate, come and face a few in the, uh, few in the nets. And he, Brett Lee fucking peppered him off the long run here where Brett Lee's you know, 100, 145 kilometres an hour at this point in time. Pierce completely What did Piers Morgan say about him? Not not entirely sure, but uh, nothing uh, nothing complimentary. That's for sure. So Binger bails him up at the net, and to Pierce's credit, he he, he takes it. But uh, Binger came into a wave of criticism after this too. For this is not it. not so much bullying, but in Pierce's way, he he came out and talked shit. So this is just him getting his slice of humble pie, basically. Oh. Fuck, that's hurt. Mate, that's hurty, like, bro. That's fucking. <laughs> I think that was where he got the shits with it. Yeah, but he's still sort yeah. of like playing but, it up for mate, the cameras. This, is, this now. is where the ego of Pierce Morgan comes into comes into play. Where it's <laughs> oh, he's yeah. swearing up a storm, man. He's not. Oh. He's Mate, just pegging a cricket ball at him. That's basically. what he's doing. But bounce, letting yeah. it bounce. Like he took his eyes off that then, Pierce. That's golden rule. Oh, oh cops another one. That's in the elbow. Well, that just the hand. like your weekend's fucked there. Like you. That's fucked, man. Uh, you can see there he's gone from being cool with it to he's no. This is gone from being a yeah. joke to yeah. being yeah. like yeah. I'm getting hit <laughs> repeatedly like, on, with a cricket ball. <laughs> <laughs> which one? Yeah, yeah. Which one do you do first, man? Do you take the Kimbo slice shot or do you do a full over oh, from Brett Lee know. head hunting? <laughs> Maybe slice. No, Maybe, Maybe slice. No, no. I no? you take the over. But yeah. you, just, you don't gear it up as much. You just. Be smart. Yeah, don't like, get underneath them. You've got all the padding there as well. Like, I mean, Kimbo's coming straight at your rib cage, so that that can't be positive. <laughs> but um, heard a story from uh, the Lee brothers where we saw Warney there on the television. Cricketing legend Shane Warne was over in India, sitting by the pool with Shane Lee, like Brett, Brett's brother, and Warney being. Uh, the coxman that he is is like seen uh, <laughs> oh, staying in, on, on, on tour on tour over there. He's seen staying in a six star resort. Sees a bunch of uh, these are all alleged as well. Whether this happened or not, I don't know. So you know, I'll tell it anyway. Definitely do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, do it. Just mindful of that defamation suit. But um, <laughs> Warney's Warney's sitting by the pool with Shane Lee on an off day over there whilst they're on tour. Sees a couple of birds, uh, local birds over on the other side of the pool, and he's like. Look at that! Look at those birds. We'll go. We'll go talk to them, mate. Stay here. We're going to have dinner with these birds tonight. <laughs> Wanders straight over. Inside five minutes, comes back, mate. We're going over to their place. Like they they live in the fucking super rich neighbourhood, like uh, up in the hills. We're going over for dinner. It's 
like shooting fish in a barrel sort of thing, like hoping to have a shower with them probably. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> no cleanse. Yeah, hoping to cleanse with these women. Like, <laughs> and he, um, it's like, yeah, right, let's get our kid on. Going to head over that night and these birds, and India being cricket is religion, have told literally everyone that they know, and the streets barricaded <laughs> off with five, six hundred people with with a barricade. So all the bill, billion population over there. So the little local neighbourhood, there's eighteen million people up. living in there. They've told five or six hundred million people, and they get greeted at the end of the street when their driver's driven them out there, and they had to spend four, five, six hours over there uh, m- meeting everyone, and didn't even pop. Just talking birds. shit. <laughs> it's just too much of a clusterfuck. They didn't even get to cleanse with them. <laughs> Hashtag cleanse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's it. <laughs> Cleansing with birds. Um, you um, played a bunch of footy with your older brother, Damon. He, did Damon go to a, a Commonwealth Games in Rugby Sevens? Yeah, he went to yeah. 2006, one in Melbourne, yeah. Melbourne, a local Commonwealth yeah. Games too. That, that's bad. a good one. The, yeah. the Sevens format is a, is a fascinating one and it seems the Japanese rugby seems held to skelter. It seems like a 15-man Sevens from, like you mentioned before with the preseason, they're just running their asses off constantly. And Japan have had success too. Like their method, Ed, Eddie Jones at the last World Cup, the famous coach who had coached the Wallabies before, had gone over there and they beat the Springboks in the in the first opening round of the World Cup over there. So they've had success. If you were to say, I mean, you've won, won premierships out here in Queensland Premier Rugby, that Brethren team that you played with to win the title, how do they translate against someone like Rotherham or Cannon? Is it a com- competitive game of football or is it, you know, it's a, a mismatch or...? I think uh, Rotherham, it's a little bit different. Obviously, it's really forward dominated over there. Yep. And, uh, we- weather dictates that a little bit as well. Weather dictates as well, yeah. So, the big, angry kind of props and second rowers and those kind of boys getting around. So, it's a different game, but I'd say it'd be a competitive one, but it just set pieces probably get dominated. Mm. Um, still, it'd be interesting. There'd probably be a lot of goal kicks and, and penalty kicks and that kind of stuff. But uh, I think, you know, especially in the era that I played at Brothers, we played a, a similar style of football as they play in Japan. Like, I was playing at 10, but I tried to kick the ball as, as less many times as possible. Mm-hmm. You know I mean, we wanted to run it from everywhere. Run it. Yeah. If you look back and you, and you see some of the tries that boys scored before, or even when I was playing, like, it was just 100-meter tries. Like, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So I think that'd be really competitive. It just depends, I think, on, you know, someone like Cannon. We had some great internationals. We had Willie LaRue and Adam Thompson and those boys and Carl Lowe, those guys. But... It all depends on how good your Japanese guys are, and so we had some good players, but our depth probably wasn't there. Mm. And so if they play someone like a, a Suntory or a, you know, a Panasonic, if you've got Beric Barnes, they're internationals, and 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 Daniel Heenan, those guys, but they're quality. Daniel Heenan, yeah. yeah, that's a name I haven't heard for a while. He's actually a, a Japanese national now. Really? True. Yeah, well. so he's qualified. So, well, but el- what the eligibility is a couple of years for that? Three Where, years. Three yeah. years. Oh, wow. Mm. We actually got a, a guy that was in our grade in high school, uh, Luke Samoa. Following him on Instagram um, now, he's done done a similar path where he's gone gone abroad and is playing for Romania against Canada this weekend in no World shit. Cup qualification really? games. No yeah. shit. So chances are Japanese uh, hosting the World Cup next year. Might see Luke Samara on TV wow. playing 10 for Romania. <laughs> so it looks in uh, really good nick over there too. He was <laughs> good too. He was always a really strong kicker of the ball mm. and he's... Uh, Seems to be going well over there. So, and, and I mean, yeah, why not as well? Why not? Why not? Where, but buddy of ours through high school, Joe Gardner, he went and played sevens for Portugal. Yeah, so that's he's right. A Portuguese national and ended up going and playing college football in America as a punter. He's running pro there. kick now, isn't he? He mm, is. Yeah, yeah. 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 Joe yeah. is doing like running kicking clinics and stuff. Okay, so, yeah. so yeah. pro kicks like a a clinic that come to teams to teach them how to feel. Like to, to kick an NFL ball, kick. yeah, yeah. And, oh, an NFL ball, NFL. Like hunting in NFL. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. So he, he he was always a gun kicker, eh? Yeah. Jo- Joey had tried out for numerous NRL franchises that, <laughs> that it had like camps and stuff like that. Was that sort of ability? But I think we could see more and more Australians transcend into NFL like that, where it is so stock standard for us to get get the punters because Aussie rules background. And that's where mm. dudes like Hayne getting in. It seems like what he's actually fucking. He's doing something out there. He's not. He's not kicking, but. Brad Wing, another guy over there. He plays for New York Giants in that competition. Just broke up with so. Lolo Jones. Did he really? Oh, wow. <laughs> really? Wow. Fuck, Who's Lolo Luke? Jones? Uh, American athletic superstar. That's one to do. She's a, a devout a Christian. This shit. Really? Oh, so yeah. Wow. Oh, that just yeah. She's a. I think she's a virgin from all reports. I don't know. I can't see her on <laughs> social media. <laughs> yeah. But I saw like I was pretty pumped because I think she's fantastic. Like she's just gorgeous. Oh Damn, wow. Damn girl. Yep. I would. Uh, I would cleanse with Lolo Jones. Yeah, I'm here. definitely. Yeah. Like, she's just gorgeous. <laughs> 
<laughs> the, top, uh, the top searches are ESPN and abs. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Hurdler. Oh, Jones. Damn, girl. Brad Wing. Throw, throw your hat into the ring, son. Good yeah. man. That's the uh, that is that Australian thing too, right? That geez, it goes a long way abroad. <laughs> it really does. This, yeah, is, that, does. this <laughs> is the second podcast in a row where we've ended up on Google Images of some hot chick. Where everybody, <laughs> yeah. everybody just sitting around like oh, the last God. one was actually Pamela Anderson, where we were like, <laughs> CJ. like Pamela Anderson, nineteen ninety seven. Holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> it just gets to that point where you just start creeping birds. <laughs> yeah, Let's just roll on the Lolo at all. <laughs> we touched She's on fit. Yeah, touched on uh, your brother before. Played a lot of footy alongside him as well, which must be a good experience, but getting to play with your brother. Yeah, most definitely. I think it's probably the time I enjoyed my footy the most. Like, mm. obviously, he was playing fullback, I was playing fly half, and we had a lot of fun, you know. We scored a lot of tries and, and did a lot of stuff together. And this I was a brothers? Most. Yeah, brothers, yeah. Do you... So, he, he played the Sevens Tour as well as almost fucking the prime gig. You just get to tour around. You're on, the, you're on a circuit, so they play, what, basically 10 stops a year on this yeah, circuit. 10, they yeah. go from... Like Vegas out to Australia, over to Japan, New Zealand, like the Christchurch Sevens and stuff like that. It just that seems to be the tour to be on. It's basically the best city in each country. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so shit. Oh, man. <laughs> London, that. Paris, yeah. Yeah. zero banter with the boys on travel Sydney. tours and shit oh, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Man, oh, man. <laughs> that, that's the tour to be on, and even rugby as well gets you a ticket. Is that in the Olympics? Is that it is now, the, yeah. the next yeah. Olympics? That that'd be the ticket to get on. Was yeah. it in the last one? Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. The women won. Yeah, Fiji. Yeah. That's mm. right. Yeah, Australia. That's Australia, right. Australia, Australia There's some the women. smoke shows in that female team too. Mm. Some mm. of that female mm. hard body. Fit. Like, I ain't mad at that. Yeah. Mm. Female hard body on Instagram. <laughs> 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 Damn, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Just Danny Spew taking a shit yeah. on yeah. the day yeah. morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny you said that, man. Now I know when you shit because yeah. that's when you tag us and all that shit. <laughs> yeah. Pretty yeah. Much. Pretty You're shitting right now. I know. Danny is shitting. You uh, shit a lot, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got lie. the uh, the your brother now has gone from that professional level of rugby union into refereeing. Is yeah. that right? So he's kind of done the full circle. So he obviously played on the on the on the circuit for Australia, and then now he's the the referee. So he's the sevens referee, and he's on the okay seven circuit doing that and. He's done a few Super Rugby games on the sideline as, the, as a touch judge, but he's loving it, like loving every minute of it. So still affiliated with Rugby Union as well. If, you, if yeah. you're into it and you've got, well, they've got the gas tank to be a referee as well. Like it's just as yeah, much cardio involved in being mm. a referee as uh, such a high pressure job and unrewarding. Like no yeah. one's gonna, <laughs> geez, no one's gonna good. come off and go. Well done, geez, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Geez, you, no ref- Mate, you, you had a fucking blind yeah. today. Like. That was a really fair game you did out there, guy. That was good. You <laughs> fucking no. blind, mate. Yeah, yeah. your fucking eyes painted on, like yeah. all, all those sort of things. Like the, the officiating is one of the hardest jobs in there, and it's important that people do transition into that, where ex players do have an upper hand of going into that world. I feel from someone like me, if I was to go into refereeing, having nil athletic ability at, or played at any sort of professional level, I don't have that insight of what it's like on the other side of the whistle. Where mm. Watching the game. Like, yeah. it, it's so fast and having like the sort of the background where you've, you've watched footy like that and you can sort of see things happen a little bit more than so what I could probably see. Man, I've been watching, you know, footy in, all, in, in a few different forms for, <laughs> fuck, since I was probably seven years old, man. So it's like more, more than a couple of decades. And I'll still watch a game of league or union and I'll be like, well, what's the ruling there? Like, I, like you know, to have that analytical mind for the rules of the game, to know in every single situation when this player's done this and this player's done that, that, oh, that's actually a penalty against this team for these reasons. And to know that code, like, I ain't sleeping on the referees, man. I, was, I, I think it was last round in the NRL there was um, – I felt like it was like a debut ref because he was sort of – he didn't have that clout, that sort of what control over that? the players. I can't remember what game it was, but it was like it was like two it was like two teams in the NRL that have like a decent level captain and the, the captains were fucking giving this guy like a real hard time, man. I, I was, I was, it might have even been Storm versus Cronulla. I think it might have been, maybe. I'm not sure. But I, I was watching it and I was like, this guy seems like it might be his debut in the NRL. <laughs> and yeah. fuck, I feel for him. <laughs> like, because he's not winning any friends. Gallon here, and like. Smith, man. But he was yeah. standing his ground. He was standing yeah. his ground and he knew the rules and, and that sort of shit. But, you know, fucking just in the same way that I can't understand the current, you know, rugby championship 
set up. <laughs> 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 There's still rules when I watch it when yeah. I watch a game of league or union that I'm sort of like, fuck, how did, how does this work? Oh, like, what? and then you add the video ref component into it now, and it's sort of like, fuck, you can't make a wrong decision because you're gonna be you're gonna be hung, drawn, and courted. Well, they still miss a lot of that stuff too. I mean, the bunker in NRL, for example, miss a knock on of Uate's last week that was just blatant. So they've got. Touchies for me, like the, the touch judge, the sideline official for me, have got the most fucking case to answer for in terms of forward passes. And the thing with me, with the NRL, I'd love for him to be able to do technology on a forward pass. Like, I think that, that could be groundbreaking for them. I just don't know if it's possible. You'd be able to do that. You, you know the line in swimming where they're like, fuck, Thorpey's on the record. <laughs> <world> record. <laughs> Have that moving up with the set no. at, 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 yeah. at the line. You'd be know. able to do that for know. sure, man. I'm doing I'm some... available in NRL. Talk you to can me. do it. You could, let's do Todd, it. Todd Greenberg, let's have a conversation, <laughs> dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, shit, man. Thanks so much for coming on. We really appreciate your time and everything like that. And it's it's always great to talk to somebody who's, you know, been out there doing some different shit and, and, and really respect, you know, like that that sort of path that, that guys like yourself have taken in life. And it's great to see, like, you know, I mean, you know, even just creeping your Instagram and stuff like that, it looks like you've had a pretty sweet, like last couple of years and stuff like that man so we really appreciate you taking the time to have a chat about your experience and all that sort of shit yeah and, th- thoroughly uh, uh, thoroughly enjoyed stalking your brother it was good man i'll probably do that tonight before <laughs> <laughs> i'm just gonna start yeah, now yeah, yeah. so man this dude just like 90 of my picks so like <laughs> <laughs> from, from over two years ago <laughs> oh, shit. Well, us, us boys are off to uh off to paintball in the morning as well too, so we got to uh, we got get, a box get our party eight hours tomorrow. in. There's, yeah, right. There's a box yeah. on tomorrow, which good stuff. Could potentially end up absolutely fucking disgraceful. But <laughs> at the same <laughs> time, it's not me that's getting married, so I don't got nothing to worry about. So, <laughs> listen, <laughs> Dallin, man, thanks thanks for taking your time out of your Friday night to come talk to us. Good talking to like-minded people, as Danny said, that have been there and done it. We're growing our product, and we're fucking. Our nose on the grindstone. We're keeping at it. Knock off nation. Hang in there. Kyle, Stephen, thanks Thank for, you very thanks much. for coming on, man. We haven't seen you for a little while, but uh, we're back on deck. We're still putting more leads out there. If you're listening, we're going to keep doing it. So knock off nation. Thank you.